Okay, so my first question is, what does ambition mean to you? Oh, ambition to me, it, it means that you want to succeed in life um, and that you reach your goals, no matter what goals they might be. Um, for some people, it might be a successful career. For other people, it might be just perfecting your knowledge of something. It might be learning another language, um, maybe for no particular reason, but just because you like it. Um, you can have all sorts of ambition, playing an instrument, um, just doing what you would and maybe trying yourself out. I think that's um, one of the best ambitions you can have, just to try all sorts of different things and figure out what you're good at. So would you describe yourself as ambitious? Yes, um, definitely ambitious. Um, because I'm curious. I, th I think I just want to find all stuff. Um, I'm, I'm getting frustrated when I notice after reading many books that I still don't really get these issues or that I still find stuff that I never quite understood. I just recently got myself um, a whole range of books on basically school subjects just to go back into physics and chemistry and psychology and history um, just to refresh a little bit because it's now been 26 years since I left school and ever since I've done economics and law, but I felt the urge to go back to the stuff that I once knew in biology and chemistry. And if that's ambition, yeah, um, maybe I'm ambitious. Why do you think you're this way? Is this something you've always, somehow you've always been like, or do you, do you trace it back to your childhood? I certainly I trace it back to my childhood because um, I had a wonderful childhood. I had to, uh, parents who really cared for education. Uh, they had never gone to higher school themselves. Um, they, they didn't have any university education. And so they wanted to give to us um, what they didn't have. And so they made sure that there were books. They made sure that um, we learned to play an instrument. Um, they sent me to a very good school. Um, it was a state school and um, I had fantastic teachers there. So I think it just shapes you. Um, it introduces you to all sorts of different things. And yeah, once you've got that passion for learning and for doing stuff and exploring the world, I think you will never lose it again. Who would you describe as the most ambitious person that you know? And that doesn't mean that you have to know them personally, but just, you know, when I say who's the most ambitious person that you know, what pops into your mind? Strangely, no one in particular. I think we're all... In, in some ways ambitious. Um, I've got a bit of a problem with that question because I think most people would automatically assume that most ambitious person means most success, successful um, or richest or most prosperous. And I don't think that's what it is. You can be incredibly ambitious, um, but it wouldn't materialize necessarily in your income or your social status. Um, it's just something that you do for yourself. And you are striving and you're trying to become someone else or someone better and you're trying to perfect something but it doesn't necessarily show from the outside so I think you're actually a relatively poor judge if you're trying to um, determine whether other people are ambitious well I could give you, I can give you one external person um, who I thought was ambitious um, it's probably my favorite person in um, German history and that's Wilhelm von Humboldt so Wilhelm von Humboldt, if you've never heard of him, I don't blame you. He was um, the Prussian education secretary for about a year in the early 19th century. Um, so Prussia was um, basically lying down, defeated, uh, conquered by Napoleon. And uh, this Wilhelm von Humboldt, um, a diplomat, was put in charge of reforming the school system. And he did something really remarkable. So he achieved um, a complete turnaround. He wanted to give education to everyone, every child, no matter what background, everybody should have some basic education. He started um, Berlin's first university. Um, so that was also another achievement. But what made Humboldt special in my view is that his own ideal was always this accumulation of knowledge of education. He drew a lot of inspiration from ancient Greece. Um, he was fluent in Greek and I think Latin as well. Um, so he was this embodiment of a person who tried to perfect himself and his knowledge by education and he wanted to pass it on. So um, that was ambitious. Um, that was ambitious for himself and that was ambitious for what he wanted to achieve. And that's, as I said, my favorite person in the history of um, Prussia and my favorite person really in education um, 
history because that's the ideal that I still have. There is still in Germany these days talk of the Humboldtian education ideal, um, which the Germans call Bildung. And um, for me, that has a special meaning. And actually, Bildung is a special word because Bildung, you can translate it as to build something, but it's also the equivalent of education. So the formative aspects of education to actually become some, something else and to turn your personality into something different and higher and tr try to perfect yourself in that sense. Um, that, that is something that really inspires me. Is there anything that would enable you to be more ambitious? Uh, yes, um, I think more time, um, occasionally more discipline. Um, you can always do more. You can always read more. You can always write more. You can always engage more. But then again, your day has 24 hours and it, at times you just need to switch off as well. The reason I reached out and asked you to participate in this interview because was because of the comments that you made around New Zealand and ambition. And coming from afar and then living in New Zealand, you've seen a contrast in your experience in the two countries or... Yes, I have. And I've always enjoyed comparing countries. Um, going back to my PhD thesis, I wrote a thesis on not just comparative advertising, but actually I compared comparative advertising in Australia and Germany. So um, I like comparing countries and um, I've lived in four now. So I grew up in Germany. Um, I did part of my PhD in Australia already. Um, then I moved back to Germany, finished a PhD, then moved to London, had four and a half years there, then another three and a half years in Australia and now eight and a half years in New Zealand. So I can't help but compare. And when I look at New Zealand, um, my first impression when I arrived was, hey, wonderful, best quality of life I ever had. Um, and it's, it's certainly better than Sydney or London or Germany. It's, it's, it's just much nicer, friendlier, green. There are so many things to really enjoy about New Zealand. And I still do enjoy them. But beyond that, there are a few things um, that I miss about the other places in which I lived. And one of them is this lack of ambition, I think, that I notice in New Zealand. So we have almost forgotten what it means to be excellent or to strive even for excellence. Um, and I wrote this in my column. I wrote that a country that forgets what excellence is worshiping bureaucracy. And I think that's happening in, in New Zealand. I've seen it actually firsthand. I was um, a judge, and I still am a judge, on the Local Government New Zealand Excellence Awards for the past five years. And each year we get really good projects um, from local government, which most New Zealanders probably wouldn't expect because local government doesn't have the best reputation, but there, there is excellence. There are really good things happening in New Zealand government and local government. However, um, each year we also get, <clears throat> I'd say about a quarter or a third of applications for excellence awards where councils were basically just doing their jobs. Now, consulting with um, stakeholders and delivering stuff and not having that many cost overruns and basically just doing their normal job. And I mean, okay, if you do that without too many cock-ups, that's a good thing, but that's not excellence. And so I'm a little bit confused sometimes what excellence might mean in a New Zealand context. And I see it also in our education system. And since I'm so passionate about education, I'm, I miss it in education particularly. So... There's not even the idea anymore that we need to deliver an excellent education to all students and that we should um, really stimulate our young children to really try themselves out and become someone better and better educated. Mm -hmm. Instead, we talk a lot about 21st century skills, critical thinking, creativity, kindness, all of these softer things, which at first sight sound good is a positive thing. But the more you look into this, the more you come to the conclusion that they are used as an excuse for not striving for a proper education. And it is backed up, of course, in international surveys. You can see New Zealand falling down in reading, science, maths, and the PISA study. I mean, today's 15-year-olds in New Zealand have the mathematical competence that a 13-and-a-half-year-old would have had in 2000, according to PISA. And according to the Tertiary Education Commission, um, we have about two-fifths of our school leavers functionally illiterate and enumerate. So it is all very nice we're talking about creativity and kindness and 21st century skills, but if you can't read or write or calculate anymore properly, then I don't think that's meaningless. And so I have noticed this lack of ambition 
You can see the lack of ambition also in the housing market. This country simply doesn't build enough. Now we've got a massive housing affordability crisis, but even the houses that get built and the houses you can buy here, the quality of these houses often leaves a lot to be desired. And coming from Germany where it's you know, double glazing is the standard and triple glazing is uh, becoming common, common in Germany. H here you basically have single glazed homes that you can hardly heat. And you have to be lucky if you find some sort of insulation and double glazing. I think we should strive a lot harder. We shouldn't be content with putting up with that kind of stuff. And this country often finds too many excuses for non-performance. And on top of that, which is something I wrote about in the article as well, I think New Zealand is a culture where you simply don't speak your mind. Um, and that, I think, is a function of small size. At least that's my impression. Uh, because you will always meet again. It's two degrees of separation. And if I don't meet you again, I'll meet your brother or sister or colleague or whatever. And then you would have told them, oh, he, he's a bit of a difficult person, so just stay away. And so we moderate what we say. Um, I have, again, it's just personal experience living in, having lived in four countries now. Um, the level of outspokenness and openness in New Zealand is far lower than in Australia, Britain, and Germany. Um, we, we don't like talking politics in New Zealand. We don't like having a controversial argument. The, the only thing that New Zealanders really like talking about is the weather and maybe rugby and arcade fishing. Um, but having a political discussion at a dinner party is a big no-no. You don't do that because you don't want to upset anyone. Whereas the culture I come from is way more outspoken, probably for good reasons. Um, because after 45, I mean, the idea was, of course, that Germany would never want to experience a catastrophe like National Socialism again. So there was a big emphasis on political education, on civics education, on talking about history so it doesn't repeat itself. And so political conversations are a very normal thing in Germany. And the, the idea of a good German evening is that you spend you know, hours with friends over three bottles of red wine and you solve the Middle East. And afterwards, um, even though you may disagree on everything, you had a good evening and you go home and you do it again next week. In New Zealand, unthinkable. I mean, God, no, just moderate yourself. When I came here, I gave the speeches I would have given in Australia or Britain before. And then um, people would come to me at the end of my speech saying, oh, wonderful that somebody finally speaks his mind. And in the beginning, I thought it was a compliment. <laughs> and then I realized, no, no, they're trying to tell you something. It's not how we do things in New Zealand. So I took myself back a bit and bottled it up. And then after six or seven years, I just couldn't take it any longer. And I started speaking my mind again, and it felt liberating, I thought. What would if you were if you were in charge if you were pulling the levers what would what would you do I mean what would be your ambitious approach to well, these kinds of problems Yeah, it depends on the policy issues. Um, when it's education, I think New Zealand only has to go back to its own history. Until the 1990s, New Zealand had a curriculum running over, I believe from memory, was two and a half thousand pages. Today's curriculum is around 60. Um, today's curriculum actually spells out everything in social sciences, economics, history, and so on, on a single page A4 for the whole of the school career. I mean, this is a nonsense. So if we went back to a proper curriculum, just spelling out what we expect students to learn, pretty much what other countries do. I mean, just look at what England has as a curriculum now. Um, really detailed instruction. This is what we expect every child to learn at school. That's what I would do for education. And for housing? Well, I think you can only really fix the housing market, both in quality and in price terms, if you build more. The reason why we have poor quality in the housing market is because the market is so tight, you can produce really crappy housing and you will always find someone desperate enough to buy it. And uh, if you want to have better quality, better architectural quality, better insulation, better environmental features, you have to make it more affordable. Then you can afford to be picky. Currently, you can have a crap home, not insulated, not well designed, and you will still find someone desperate enough to get a foot on the ladder. And so I, I think we, we can fix these issues. And actually, I mean, we've been in this business here for, at the initiative for eight and a half years. You can come to our office and see on our wall loads of publications on a range of different issues. So from fisheries management to transport policy to welfare policy, housing, local government, mining, whatever it is. The, the recommendations are all there, but what I really miss is the guts actually to implement them. Um, give you one example, transport policy. Um, for, I don't know, 30, 40 years, New Zealand has produced basically a, a big report on transport and road pricing every two or three years. 
And each time the rec recommendation, the conclusion is always the same, that road pricing works, that it is uh, a good way of managing existing infrastructure, and um, that there is a good economic case to be made and actually you can trace the economics of that back to Adam Smith, if you like. Um, and in the meantime, of course, you can see road pricing introduced in the Middle East, in Singapore, in Scandinavia, in London, in other English cities, um, in America. So we, we know it works. You also see then that over the past 30 years, politicians of all parties in New Zealand have declared that road pricing is the way forward. But they only declared an opposition. As soon as they're in government, they back off because they don't have the courage. There's no guts to introduce any of this stuff because some voters might not like it. And the experience is, of course, that before you introduce road pricing, voters are extremely nervous about it because they think this will just cost us an arm and a leg and it won't do anything. Once it's introduced, they actually see it works. And we want to do this cost neutral, of course, so we can actually reduce some other taxes. No one has the guts to introduce it. And um, this lack of courage, the lack of political courage in all our parties, I think it is just really frustrating because we could be doing so much better. I really lack, I really miss convic conviction politicians and politicians with a little bit of courage and just guts and a gutsiness. I recently talked to a politician about that actually. And he said, oh, it's so difficult to implement the kind of reforms that you suggest because we wouldn't have enough support from the business community and the opinions po polls would be against us and our focus groups wouldn't like it. And it's really hard. And I said to that politician, well, actually, I agree, you will struggle to get all the ducks lined up in a row. Um, but if you wait until your last focus group tells you to do it, it's too late. Sometimes you just have to have the courage to do things because you know they have to be done and they're right. One of my favorite examples, again, sorry, from German history is Ludwig Erhard. So Ludwig Erhard was the economics minister after the war and then later chancellor. But before that, he was put in charge of the West German economy by the American Allied forces after World War II. And um, Erhard was a good economist, a liberal economist, and he was put in charge of administering the price controls the Americans had put in place. And one Sunday afternoon, Erhard abolished them all. He did it on a Sunday afternoon because he knew the American general wasn't working on Sunday. And uh, on Monday morning, he was then um, called into the general's office and said, Herr Erhard, you, you were not allowed to touch the price controls. What the hell were you doing? And Erhard's response was, well, I didn't touch the price controls, I abolished them. <laughs> and the effect was actually that the supermarket shelves filled again and the economy came back to life. But he had the guts to do something. And wh where is this kind of courage in New Zealand? I would like to see more of that. <laughs>